All right, everyone, if we could get your attention, please. Time to get started. <clears throat> I think this evening is going to be worse than usual in terms of people straggling in because they chose to redirect the traffic tonight in a different way, and I think it's going to take three times as long to get in here. So please be patient as others come in late. But it's time to get started. We don't want to miss a single minute of singing, do we? I don't think so. We want every minute of that we can get. So I would not be up here except uh, Jeff and his wife are both ill this evening, so they're not able to be here. So I'm the fill-in for starting us all off. And it's just kind of a special privilege because I get to introduce my son-in-law, who's going to lead the singing. And uh, the Chandlers are all up here, too. So Royce and Hope and Marilyn and I share grandchildren. Don't get me started. <laughs> they are very special to us, but no more special than Todd Chandler, their son and our son-in-law, and his precious wife, Jeannie. And so we're so glad they could both be with us tonight. And Todd's going to lead our singing. And I don't want to take one minute away from the time we can do that. So Todd, come lead us and let's get started. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17 read this way. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. To my knowledge, that's the only verse in the Bible that refers to God's singing. Singing is another way God calls us to be like Him. He sings in joy over us. And so, so one more time this week, we will join in song to Him. We will sing songs of praise, songs of heaven, I always look to our great exodus, songs of our dependence on Him, and we will close with a song of prayer. The first two songs we will sing back to back, On Jordan's Stormy Banks, and Here We Are But Straying Pilgrims. On Jordan's Stormy Banks, we'll sing the chorus one time only at the end of the third verse. I look forward to singing with you.
around us, Lord. Shield about me. Begin this as it's written, mezzo piano, modest and quiet. And many of you know this song. It is a wonderful song. It will follow the, uh, the dynamic changes, the volume changes as marked. And as perhaps as I indicated.
I was a freshman 10 years ago. Uh, I remember a, a very brief moment, we were having a devotion somewhere, and someone wanted to sing When We All Get to Heaven. And there was a very brief but memorable discussion of, can we sing this song? Because we don't know if everyone's going to heaven. <laughs> That's a freshman discussion. And <laughs> I think we ended up not singing the song because we couldn't agree to it. It's a wonderful statement of faith, and I think it's right in spirit with what John wrote in 1 John chapter 5. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that kind of hope and confidence of a Christian. We'll sing two verses of when we all get to heaven. Sing the
it back to back. We'll sing a praise to Jesus. In Jesus' name above all names. And we'll end with a prayer of Be With Me, Lord. Let's stand for these two songs, please. Thank you, Todd. That was a wonderful job. And again, we were made to think so deeply about the things we were singing and thank all of you for joining in in that wonderful way. It's a memory we'll carry with us for a long, long time. I'm pleased to introduce to you the last speaker in our lectureship of this, this evening. He will close out this wonderful series on I Brought You Out, Studies on the Exodus. His fitting message for this closing lesson is the new exodus and the final exodus. Dr. Tom Hamilton was appointed chairman of our Biblical Studies Department recently, and he's been a member of our Bible faculty uh, for a long time, since 2005. But his roots at Florida College run deep and wide farther than that. He's an alumnus of the college, AA graduate in 82 and an advanced diploma graduate in 83. He married his wife, Joy, who's also an alum, class of 84. And seven of their 11 children have been here. Five of their children are adopted. So I'm going to name those seven children. Only way I can is because they were in the book. Michael, class of 08. Bethany, class of 08 and 10. Philip, class of 11, Sarah, class of 12, Brian, class of 17, Stephen, class of 19 and 21, and Aminata, class of 24, and more to come. Are they supporters of this school? I said deep and wide. Tom's academic credentials are strong. He has a BA and an MA in Biblical Languages from Abilene Christian University, an MTS degree from Christian Theological Seminary, and a DMIN degree from Knox Theological Seminary. He is certainly qualified to be an instructor here, and we are thrilled to have him in that capacity. I will tell you, though, that Tom is much more than just a full-time faculty and department chair. 
He has also been serving us for recent years as our faculty representative on the leadership team, and most recently was elected as president of the newly formed Faculty Senate. He also serves as an evangelist at the 58th Street Church. I pause from my notes just to make a personal comment. I can tell you from my seat, Tom Hamilton has been a huge help to me personally and to this institution in his role as faculty representative and as president of the, of the Senate because he is just exactly that. He's a representative and he knows how to take people who have different viewpoints and help them come together. And that's been his passion and what a help that is. So Tom, for me personally, I want to thank you for the way you've served our institution above and beyond all the things you do in the classroom and to affect our students. Beyond all of that, ladies and gentlemen, he and Joy and their family have had a profound impact for good upon our student body and upon our staff by their godly example as husband and wife, father and mother, and with sacrificial love for all of those children and a whole lot of other folks and a godly devotion to the God of heaven and his word. We thank God for all that they have brought to Florida College and its family, and we bid you give your careful attention to our beloved Brother Tom Hamilton this evening. Come. Well, I certainly thank you for your presence, because without that, we would not have a lectureship at Florida College. And more than that, I thank you for your support, especially in sending young people our way, because without that, we wouldn't even have Florida College. I love my job. I love these young people. I have the greatest job in the world to preach and teach the greatest book to the greatest young people you will find on the face of the planet. And I love my co-workers that I labor with here in this place because I think every last single one of them feels the same passion for the mission and purpose of the college and this laser-like focus on the students and equipping them to serve the Lord in the years to come. We take what has been entrusted to us and entrusted to other trustworthy people who will be able to teach others also. I find lectures to be a special time because I, at least, certainly find it helpful to be reminded of why we are here and what we are doing. And I think it gives our guests an opportunity to come on our campus at least for a little bit and get a glimpse of what we try to do throughout the year. I'm thankful to the men who wrote the manuscripts, turned in the essays that are published in the lecture book. That is a daunting task, and they do it on such short notice. And if you don't, don't are aware of this, we're making the lecture book freely available in digital format in a repository that we have in our library that you can download that. And not only that, but eventually, if not already, all of the lecture books should be available there. You can also, of course, still order a physical copy of the lecture book if you want. And then there are the other men and women who have supplemented our lectures with the uh, classes in uh, Puckett and the afternoon lectures and the panel discussion and all of that I'm grateful for, particularly because I do feel a responsibility for the lectureship as being the newly appointed chair of the Bible faculty. And I say this sincerely, I do solicit your feedback if you have any suggestions about what works well or what could be better, a constructive criticism, I certainly would be eager to hear from you. But the feedback I've gotten so far this week seems to be that the lecture has been well received, the theme of the exodus, the job that the men have done, and of course the preparation for lectures goes on more than a year before they take place. And it is a collaborative effort among all of the members of the Bible department particularly and that's really a fun job because we get along so well, and I, I am thankful for that and don't take that for granted at all. But if you want to thank one individual in particular, 
this has been really the brainchild, the theme, the structure of the, the lectures and how they're organized and fit together so well. If you want to direct your gratitude to one individual in particular, it is the past chair of the Bible department, David McClister. And mentioning the past chair of the Bible department, this is the point at which I would say, I am thankful for the invitation to speak, but since I work here, it doesn't work that way. And I received the same instruction that I would speak on Thursday evening that our Tuesday evening speaker received. And I just want to make it clear, the Bible department chair who gave that instruction was the former chair that will remain unnamed. <laughs> so my topic is the new exodus and the final exodus. Uh, the intent is to kind of bring together the theme of the entire week and weave all of this together to see what does it all really mean for us. And so I want to begin in Luke chapter 20 and verses 37 and 38 in particular. And this is the occasion in which the Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, want to entrap Jesus. And so they had recently viewed the 1954 musical, One Bride for Seven Brothers. <laughs> that was actually the original title of that movie, and it was considered too racy. Uh, but it's here 2,000 years ago. And so Jesus' response to this kind of ridiculous scenario that they cook up in verse 37, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Now, most of the time, we're familiar with the episode as it is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 22 and verse 32, where it is quoted, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the common explanation of how this is a proof of the resurrection is a grammatical one, that God said, I am, not I was. It is the present tense, and therefore we know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. But does that argument really hold water? I mean, you think about it. What in that argument suggests a resurrection? At best, it would suggest that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have not been annihilated. They still exist somewhere, but there's nothing in there about reanimating a dead body and reuniting it with their departed spirit. Where does the resurrection come in? And a second problem that we have with that argument is that the grammar simply will not carry the weight that we're trying to put on it. Imagine going to a funeral for somebody and you meet the deceased parent and the father is an atheist and he introduces himself by saying, I am so-and-so's father. Now as a Christian, would you logically then say, oh, I'm so glad to hear you believe in the resurrection. Or if the deceased father is a Christian and were to say, I was so-and-so's father. Oh, so sorry to hear you don't believe in the resurrection. Well, the reality is the grammar just does not carry the weight we're trying to put upon it. The third problem I have with this argument is when you turn over to Mark's account in Mark chapter 12 and verse 26, the I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is there, but there's no verb the I am, the am part, is omitted. Now, you can say it's understood and can be supplied, and that's certainly true, but if that's the focus of the argument, that would seem to be an awful peculiar thing to do, especially when you consider that Matthew and Mark are both quoting the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, where both the pronoun and the verb are included, so Mark would have to intentionally omit it. Why would he do that if that was the heart of the argument? And looking here in Luke chapter 20, you can't even get a being verb in that at all. And so I don't think that's the answer. So why is this the argument about the resurrection in the Gospels? You know, we get in the book of Acts and in the epistles... We get a lot of other arguments about the resurrection rooted in Old Testament Scripture, the majority of which come from the Psalms, but also the prophets. But in the Gospels, 
it's this reference to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6 at the burning bush. I want to suggest two keys to why Jesus uses this argument. The first is the critical importance of the promise that God has made to Abraham. To use the words of the Apostle Paul from the book of Ephesians, this is none other than God's eternal purpose. That before the creation of the world, that God had a divine plan, a single unchanging strategy by which he was going to save all people. That's his eternal purpose. And that eternal purpose is expressed and communicated in this promise that God made to Abraham. How do I know that? Well, if we turn over to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, we read there this statement by the Apostle Paul that the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles or the nations by faith or trust preached the gospel ahead of time to Abraham saying all the nations will be blessed in you. Now think about the significance about what Paul says. First of all, we should stop and say, well, what in the world does this statement, all the nations will be blessed in you, what does that have to do with salvation? Paul concludes, all the nations are going to be saved. They're going to be justified. They're going to be forgiven of their sins. And I don't know about you, but when I read those words, all the nations will be blessed, I don't see any words there about sin or forgiveness or salvation or justification or faith. Where is Paul getting this? Well, there are a lot of blessings in the world. Better indoor plumbing would be a blessing. Cheaper groceries would be a blessing. Larger flat screen television, no, probably not. But picture somebody in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and they're drowning. They have one need. They desperately want to live. And you come along offering them cheaper groceries. How about better indoor plumbing? That's not a blessing. And certainly tossing them a bigger flat screen television to pull them down to the bottom and drown quicker is not going to be a blessing. When you have a need that is so central and so desperate, there is only one thing that counts as a blessing, and that's what's going to fix your problem. And the reality is Paul understands that all people have one problem. It's basically ourselves. And another word for that is sin. Our self-centeredness, our sin, our rebellion against God. And if that is true, if God's going to bless anybody... It's not going to be through better indoor plumbing. It's going to be by taking care of their sin problem. And that's how Paul is able to conclude that it, God is going to bless all people. He's going to bring salvation. He's going to bring a fix to the problem of sin for all people. But the other thing that's extraordinary about this passage is Paul says this gospel message, which is nothing other than God's eternal purpose, which he has accomplished in Jesus Christ, this has been preached to Abraham and really all throughout the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. What is the message of the entire Bible but the message of Christ, the message of God's purpose, the message of salvation? And it is expressed the first time here in Genesis chapter 12 where God begins by making this promise to Abraham. That's how important it is. And if you try to find in the Old Testament where this statement is found, all the nations will be blessed in you, you can't find it. You find three similar statements in chapter 12 and verse 3, and chapter 18 and verse 18, and in chapter 22 and verse 18, but none of them say quite exactly what Paul says here. And I think what he has done is intentionally woven these three statements together to conflating them together and making the point, it is not a single statement that is the issue, but that God's whole purpose has been communicated in Abraham, and not just him personally, but repeated to Isaac in chapter 26 and Jacob again in chapter 28. 
And so by the time we get to the book of Genesis, we have this mantra that develops the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. In 19 different times in the remainder of the Old Testament, this is used as a shorthand for God's covenant faithfulness. To talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not to call to mind three ancient historical characters, but it calls to mind God and what he had promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their offspring. And so what is the nature of Jesus' argument? Well, I think it is this. If in the end of all things, the covenant promises of God that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is simply that Abraham dies and his body rots in the ground and he becomes worm food, and Isaac follows, and Jacob follows, and I follow, and you follow, and there it is. That's the end. What good are the promises of God if death is the ultimate power and authority in this world, if death has the final say about what your relationship is with your Creator, if death is the ultimate determiner of our fate, then God's covenant faithfulness doesn't mean anything. It's secondary. It's conditional. It can be overturned and vetoed by death at any moment. And so if you read in the Scripture about the promises God made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and you think for one moment that death will be victorious, then Jesus will say the same thing to you that He said to those Sadducees, you Err, not knowing the Scripture or the power of God. And I know that's the argument Jesus is making because Paul makes the same argument in Acts chapter 13. Now you remember in Acts chapter 13, Paul is in the synagogue at Antioch of Pisidia. And he uses here an argument for the resurrection. He actually uses several, the others of which are drawn from the Psalms. But notice in verse 34 of Acts chapter 13, Paul quotes from Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 3. And he says, as for the fact that God raised Jesus up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Now, wait a minute. We're talking about the promises to David now. Well, those weren't a separate set of promises. That was just a subset of the promises God had made to Abraham. But you read this statement, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. I don't read anything in that statement about death or about a resurrection or about the decay of the body or its reversal. Where in the world is Paul getting this from? But the same place that Jesus did in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. And I think the focus we should put on is the word sure. How in the world can the promises that God has made to David and his offspring be sure if death can thwart them? They're not sure. We have this saying, there's only two things certain in life, death and taxes. And the Bible says, death is not certain. Our God is what is certain. And He is the God over death. And He has made a promise, and these promises are certain. Now, another interesting thing about this passage, you'll notice Paul is arguing from Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 3 for the literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus. It had to be. Because of this statement in Isaiah 55 and verse 3. But you know something interesting? This you that is used by Isaiah and quoted by Paul in Acts chapter 13 and verse 34, it's a plural you. It's y'all. I will give y'all the holy and sure blessings of David. And what that means is whoever's included in that group of you if it means Jesus is going to literally be resurrected with a body, 
then everybody else has to as well or the logic doesn't hold. And so you see how important this promise to Abraham is as the entire eternal purpose that God has to redeem man from sin, which includes not just spiritual death, but physical death as well. Well, there's a second key that I would suggest to explain why Jesus uses this passage in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6 and makes an argument about the resurrection. Yes, it's important about the promises God has made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but as we've already mentioned, there are 19 different passages Jesus could have used to make the same point. But he chooses this one in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6 at the burning bush. Why? Because as has been said repeatedly throughout this week, the Exodus is the greatest example of God's deliverance, of God's redemption of people out of their bondage. And so it becomes the pattern for every other redemptive act that God undertakes. And it starts here at the end of Exodus chapter 2, where in verse 24 we are told that God remembered His promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he goes on to indicate in chapter 3 that yes, they knew him by his name Yahweh. They used that label, that name all of the time. But they didn't see the fullness of God acting consistent with his covenant. That he had not yet fulfilled those promises. To use the language of the Hebrew writer, the patriarchs were only heirs of the promise. They died in faith without receiving the promises and did not receive what was promised. But now that Moses has come, God has now given us the definitive exhibition of what redemption looks like, of how God can save a people who themselves could not save anything. I mean, you you think of the picture of the one superpower on the face of the planet armed to the teeth, and you have all these dispirited slaves who have no weapons, And they're somehow going to beat the Egyptians. Well, of course, they couldn't and they didn't. But God did. And God puts this pattern on display for all the world to see. And for the next 1,500 years, the prophets and the other writers of the Old Testament point back to this as the pattern of God's deliverance. And that does two things. It emphasizes that God is faithful. God made his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he has kept them. And that also has a future kind of emphasis because if God has been faithful, we can trust him to be faithful in the future. But also it emphasizes that there is even something more that is yet to come, that there is a greater, truer, more complete fulfillment that is yet to be. And how do we know that? Well, we see passages like 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, that the prophets themselves knew that they were talking about something bigger than just their mundane contemporary issues because the words that God gave them were just too big. The concepts that they were speaking to people seemed to suggest something greater and far beyond them. And so Peter says, these prophets are like outsiders trying to peek in through the window. What is going on here? Who are we talking about? When is this going to happen? And not only the Old Testament prophets, but the angelic beings are trying to peek through the window. And how little did those Sadducees understand any of this? That right before their very eyes, the Creator had taken on human form and even at that very moment was breaking in upon them this new and greater exodus that Jesus had come to accomplish to redeem us from our sin. And there's still some Christians who don't even understand or realize this. You stop and think about this. We have a front row seat on the stage of history those things that all those people in the past and even the angelic beings longed to look into, thirsted to know, had no clue about. And here we sit, having revealed to us by the full revelation of God, His eternal purpose fulfilled in Christ. We get to see and to experience and appreciate something they could not even begin to dream of. 
Do we appreciate that? That's the question. Do we understand what that really means? And so what we have seen throughout this week as our lecture speakers have done such an excellent job, we have seen Jesus as a new Moses. We have seen real deliverance from the bondage of our sin because Jesus is that Passover sacrifice for us. We see a new law, a new covenant, a new relationship with God, a new tabernacle and dwelling place with God. We have a true high priest that can really get the job done and intercede on behalf of our sin. And we have this new journey that we've started as we pass through this wilderness, striving to get to the promised land. And that's really what this lecture is about, the new exodus that Christ has already inaugurated, and yet that final exodus that needs to be completed at the end. And so we're kind of in this already but not yet time period. We're in this wilderness wandering, which is a time of trial, a time of testing, a time of waiting, and a time of trusting in God. And so we sing these songs, This World is Not My Home. And of all of the books of the New Testament I think of to develop this idea, I think 1 Peter comes to mind so easily because he talks about us as strangers and sojourners and resident aliens. Even his language in chapter 1 and verse 13 about girding up the loins of our mind is an echo of the Exodus story where they girded themselves up to prepare for the travel and the journey ahead. And so... I want us to think about two practical questions. Number one, what is the importance of the promise to Abraham to me, and what difference does it make? And secondly, what is the meaning of the Exodus pattern, and what difference does it make? And so what you will see is the two keys that I have suggested for understanding Jesus' use of Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6 to argue about the resurrection are the same two things I want us to focus on in a practical way. What difference does it make? What difference does God's eternal purpose make? What difference does this new Exodus that He has inaugurated in Jesus Christ make? And I want to answer the second one first. And I want to do so by reference to 1 Peter chapter 2. The text from verse 4 through verse 10 is one that in the past I have audaciously called the single most significant text on evangelism in the New Testament. And I hope you'll see what I mean by that here in a moment. But verse 9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now this word proclaim is an interesting word. It's used all throughout the Septuagint, that Greek translation of the Old Testament, but especially in the Psalms. It predominates in the Psalms. And it's not a word that's used of preaching or just proclaiming or giving a speech. It is a worshipful term of offering up praise and thanksgiving to God. And this worshipful theme is a continuation of that emphasis from back in chapter 2 and verse uh, 5 that we are living stones, just like Jesus is a living stone. And just as He was rejected by men, we may very well be rejected by men. But just as surely as God's opinion of Jesus, which is much more important than human opinion, It's God's opinion of us that we are chosen and precious to God that should be more meaningful to us than whatever rejection that people may give us. But as these living stones, we are to be built up into a spiritual house. Another word we could use for that is a temple. And we're to be a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God And what that worship will ultimately result in is this proclamation in verse 9 of praise and thanksgiving to God. Now you may recognize that verse 9, this description of us as God's people, this is exactly the point. 
that all of those types and models and patterns that we talk about, Jesus as a new Moses, a new deliverance, a new sacrifice, and so on, it all boils down to the fact that we are the new Israel, that we have been redefined as God's people. It's no longer those who are physically related to Abraham, but rather those who are children of Abraham by having the same faith that Abraham did. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6. And you'll find this all over the New Testament. The new Jerusalem is part of this imagery. Uh, The idea in Romans chapter 2 that we're to be Jews inwardly circumcised on the heart. The passage I would focus on is the very last verse of Galatians chapter 3 as part of that extended argument. You know, that's the same chapter we started with, that the gospel is being proclaimed ahead of time to Abraham. And at the very end of that chapter, Paul says, if you are of Christ, that is, if you belong to Christ, you are the seed of Abraham, heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so here Peter picks up on that. We are God's people. And one of the ways he emphasizes that here in verse 9 is by borrowing the language from Exodus chapter 19. And there as Israel is gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses tells them that they are that chosen race, that royal priesthood or a kingdom of priests, a holy nation and a people for God's possession. And the most interesting thing of that description I would draw your attention to is this role that we have as priests. And that's something I think is greatly misunderstood by many. I think Luther contributed to that by talking about a priesthood of believers and reading that through the lens of the Roman Catholic priesthood and reacting against that. If you're thinking of a priesthood in the sense of atoning for sin, the book of Hebrews makes it pretty clear There is only one priest that has ever done that, truly. And he did it so well, it never needs to be done again. And that is Jesus Christ. And so the picture that's being painted isn't Jesus as the high priest and we're all, you know, lackey priests under his uh, service. But I think the point is we are priests in the same sense that the nation of Israel were to be priests. Well, what did that mean? And clearly Moses was not saying to the Israelites in Exodus chapter 19, guess what? You're going to be a nation that has priests. I mean, find a nation in the ancient world that didn't have priests. God might as well said, you're going to be people that breathe oxygen. At least that's probably something they wouldn't have understood as well. And I don't think it means all of you can be priests because we get several stories from that point on of wannabe priests and every time they step forward, if they're not of the family of Aaron and the tribe of Levi, they get vaporized. You cannot be a priest. No, what God is talking about is something quite different. The idea of a priest is someone who stands between God and someone who is separated from God. And the whole nation of Israel was being called to a special role to take the knowledge of the one true God and take that to the world. And in that they serve a priestly function. And I think Peter's saying the same thing. We're all priests in the same sense. We have learned the truth. We have a knowledge of who Jesus really is, what God's great eternal purpose is that he has brought about in Jesus Christ. And what do we do with it? We proclaim it. And what we're proclaiming is not a five-step self-improvement plan. We are proclaiming Christ. We are proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of the darkness and into the light. And to do that, we have to be holy. I preached a sermon I borrowed from my brother James called Peter's Practical Principles for Pure Living. It was back in my alliterative stage. (laughs) Or really James's. I think I stole the title as well. But you'll notice as you go through 1 Peter, especially at the beginning, a constant emphasis upon holiness. And here we see that we're to be a holy priesthood and a holy nation. And of course, we often hear holiness defined in terms of separation. 
to be set apart. And I don't have a particular objection to what that means, but what do we do with it? And I think there's a mistake that we often make that we so emphasize holiness in a certain stereotypical fashion that we fixate upon our own personal moral integrity. And I certainly don't want to compromise that. I don't want to lose my holiness because I do things I shouldn't do or not do things I ought to be doing. But that has a tendency to get into our mind and say, well, I need to move to the northernmost reaches of Idaho up in the mountains and I'm going to build a little commune, a utopia of only Christians and we're going to get away from the world. But the world we have a problem with is not people, it's not planet earth, it's that corruption and rebellion and sin that is in our own heart and wherever we go we drag it with us. We're not getting away from the world in that sense. And we're deceiving ourselves to think we can get away from the world that way. But imagine for a moment if Jesus felt that way when the Father says, look at planet earth. They're desperately sick. They are in need of salvation. And Jesus looks down from heaven and says, what a moral cesspool. Those people are absolutely filthy. I am not going to go down there and rub elbows with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners because I cannot compromise my holiness. Well, I'm not suggesting for a moment we ever should or that Jesus did. But what I want to point out to us is there's another dimension to holiness. If you're going to be a holy nation and a holy priesthood, because the idea of holiness is purity. And we need to be pure in our moral conduct and behavior. But we also need to be equally pure in our compassion and love for broken people. And if we love people like Jesus loved people, he would look down upon this sewer we live in and take pity and say, I'm willing to come down. And I will not compromise my holiness in terms of personal morality, but neither will I compromise my holiness, my pure love for those that are so desperately in need of salvation. And so what Peter calls us to is to truly be a holy people. And if we understand, if we have an inkling at all of what we have been freed from in this exodus, that our bondage to sin was not just a bondage like Israel was in bondage to the Egyptians. It was a bondage of death. It was a bondage of despair and damnation eternally. And God freed us from that. And so we don't go to people with a holier-than-thou attitude, but rather as one person who is starving, I think I found some bread to offer to other starving people. And so we serve this priestly function. We have this knowledge of Christ, and we proclaim it to the world. Does the pattern of the exodus and God's deliverance make a difference in my life? I pray to God that it does, and that we will all be holy people, and to love people in a holy way, and to be pure in our compassion. The other question, does the promise to Abraham make a difference to us? And here I would direct your attention to the first time that God expresses that promise in Genesis chapter 12, in verse 2, and this name may not be obvious to you from your English translation, it normally says something like, you will be a blessing. And that's not particularly a wrong translation, but it depends how you read it. It's kind of like when your mother comes in and says, you will clean your room. This is not a prediction of the future. It is a command. And in fact, the, the grammatical form of this statement is an imperative. It is a command. We could state it more directly simply, be a blessing or you must be a blessing in other words we must read the promise to Abraham not as something like now Abraham you just sat down there and I'm gonna dump all these blessings on you and you don't do anything no God says I'm going to bless you 
And you need to in turn be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And what is that blessing? But salvation and forgiveness of sins. In other words, if we're going to be the seed of Abraham, and Paul said we are in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, and that promise has been passed to us as well, and I don't think Paul means by that the fulfillment of that promise. There are senses in which we still await the fulfillment of that promise. And if there are blessings that are yet to be received, do we not also understand that there are equally the obligations that are yet to be fulfilled? To be the seed of Abraham is to be offered blessing, but also to be offered work. And Isaiah, of all the prophets, is the one that develops this quite well in chapters 40 through 55 of his book, and he's constantly talking about the servant of the Lord. And the servant of the Lord is said to be Israel. It's a group of people, and they're blind, and they're deaf, and they're doing a terrible job. And then on the other hand, the servant of the Lord is a person who's going to fix what's wrong with Israel, and not only that, but bring the Gentiles in and make them part of Israel. And it's no wonder that the Ethiopian said, who in the world is Isaiah talking about? And what he's talking about is this role of being the servant of the Lord, and the nation of Israel steps into that, and they did a terrible job. Jesus steps into that role, and he's the only one who has done it perfectly. And here we are, the new Israel, the heirs of the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the new God's people, we are the servant of the Lord. And the question is, do we do any better of a job than they did? That instead of being an influence upon the world, that the world is more of an influence upon us. And so this is why the Gospel of Matthew ends the way that it does. You know, Matthew is set out to prove to us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham and the promise to David. If you have any doubt about that, just read the very first verse of the book. This is the genealogy of Jesus, son of David, and son of Abraham. And that's not because David was Jesus' pappy and uh, Abraham was his grandpappy. It's because these are the two to whom the great promises were given in Genesis chapter 12 and 2 Samuel chapter 7. And so Jesus is the one who's come to repair what's broken with Israel and come to bring the Gentiles in and make them part of Israel. And so how does the book end? All authority has been given to me in heaven and upon earth. Go therefore and disciple all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Why are we discipling nations? Because that's how we bless them. I certainly don't have the power to force anyone to be a follower of Jesus. Only the power of God, the power of the Word of God touching and transforming someone's life can do that. But clearly Jesus is calling us to fill that priestly function of taking this knowledge of the gospel to the world and blessing people. And what are we blessing them with? Better indoor plumbing, bigger flat screen TV sets, or the forgiveness of sin. There are a lot of things we can do that are a blessing to people. Mow your neighbor's yard, take some food over to them when they're suffering some crisis in their life, hold their hand while they're sick and dying. And I don't mean to minimize any of these deeds of kindness, and they are a blessing. And they do, rightly understood, reflect the image and character of Christ alive in our life. But if we don't ever teach them about Jesus, have we blessed them at all? And I am ashamed to say that far too often, I have been more of a curse than I have been a blessing.
Would you pray with me, please? Our Holy Father, I pray you would look into our heart and see that our faith is so often weak. And we would pray as the anguished Father in Mark chapter 9, we do believe, but help our unbelief. That we often think, had we been present in Egypt and seen the plagues against the Egyptians, or the parting of the Red Sea, or if we had stood at the foot of Mount Sinai, that we could have heard the thundering booms and seen the dazzling flashes of lightning and fire and felt the ground tremble beneath our feet. Strengthen our faith, Father, so that we can see that we have come to a mountain, Mount Zion, a mighty mountain that cannot be touched by human hands, that is brilliant with the radiance of your glory that cannot be seen by physical eyes, and thunders with a sound that we could never hear with our physical ears. And the very ground shakes in a way that our bodies could never feel. But even the heavens and the earth shake, and the very foundations of hell are shaken by your power. And that we are so thankful that we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and a promise that can never fail and a king who can never be defeated. And it is him that we pray, the King of kings and Lord of lords, our Jesus, and amen. Well, this is the point at which the chair of the Bible department gets up (laughs) to make an announcement. You may have heard there is a major announcement about the future of Florida College. And here it is. We're going to have lectures next year in 2023. Well, I guess that's a, that'll be good. And so, uh, because we wanted to follow up the Exodus, you have to think of a theme that would kind of go well following that. So we're going to have 40 years of fundraising. No, not really. Uh, The topic for next year is approving the things that are excellent, studies in the Macedonian epistles, that is 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and the book of Philippians. Paul had a very special relationship with those churches. They are the three epistles that he writes to Christians in which he does not need to cite his apostolic authority. So we invite you to come back next year and study those letters together with us. Thank you, Brother Tom, and good evening, brothers and sisters. My name is Craig Hodges, and I'm on the board of directors here at the college, and I'm also the chair of the Presidential Search Committee. And I know you share with me the exciting announcement that Tom made, but there's more. Uh, And I am honored tonight and excited to announce to all of you in the room and online who the next president of Florida College will be, effective June 1, 2022. But before I do that, (laughs) I've worked really hard on this. I'd like to ask Buddy and Marilyn, if they would, to please come up here.
Thank you. You can go sit down now. <laughs> you really want us no. to sit down? As many of you know, President Payne announced that this academic year would be his final one as president of the college. And he served as our fifth president for the last 12 and a half, nearly 13 years. As you just experienced, his love of this school, the students, the faculty, the staff, the alumni is unprecedented. His focus on keeping the college fully committed to the mission and charter of this school is unrivaled, and I can assure you from a board perspective this will continue in the years ahead. But his dedicated service as our president has been a truly remarkable success and is marked by significant advances in our educational programs, our facilities, and our financial stability. During his leadership, our bachelor programs have grown to 28 four-year degrees, numerous, yes, <laughs> numerous Numerous buildings on the campus have been improved, some of those being Stelgus Aiken, Wilson Hall College Hall, River Cent Riverview Center. And just recently, huh, there, you have plenty of chances, just recently, the, with Buddy's support, the college raised over $800,000 on Giving Tuesday. A tremendous accomplishment. He, he, with the support of Maryland, they have worked tirelessly to connect with our constituents, increase our donor base, and improve the financial stability of the school. We could be here all night long talking about all the great achievements of his presidency, but be assured he will leave a lasting legacy for generations to come. And, and if, if you were here on Tuesday evening and his presentation of the two friends to youth, you will agree with me that there is no one like Buddy Payne. So, there will be much more recognition to come for Buddy and Marilyn as they close out this academic year, but one last time I want you to join me in expressing our deepest gratitude and thanks for their over 50 years of service to this college. Okay, that's one of, of three that we'll be speaking about this evening. The Board of Directors established a presidential search committee to find the next president of Florida College. The committee appreciates all the prayers, encouragement, and support offered to us over the last five and a half months as we've conducted our search. I would say this has been a very humbling experience for all of us on the committee. 
The committee solicited recommendations from a broad base of FC, FC constituents and the community. We identified viable candidates. We conducted extensive background reviews and personal interviews. All the final candidates were truly outstanding leaders. At the recent Board of Directors meeting that was held this past Monday, the committee reported its findings to the full board. And with thoughtful and prayerful deliberations, one candidate stood above the others. And the Board of Directors of Florida College has unanimously elected Dr. John Weaver to be the next president. In a moment, in a moment, John will have the opportunity to speak with all of us here in the hall and online. But before that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about John's background. He came to Florida College in the fall of 2019, and after a transition period, he assumed the role of academic dean and professor of Bible in January 2020. As the academic dean, he and the faculty have been hard at work in developing and implementing additional fields of study for the college, nursing, kinesiology, marketing, and a specialization in mass communications. Several other new programs of study are in the pipeline for the coming year. John has been instrumental in the renovation of the Chatlos Learning Commons and the creation within that facility of a next generation media studio. He's also led the staff in faculty development, specifically, as was mentioned earlier, the establishment of the first faculty senate here at Florida College. Dr. Weaver was awarded his undergraduate degree, summa cum laude, from the University of Arkansas. He holds an MA degree from the University of Chicago Divinity School, a Master of Library Information Sciences degree from the University of South Carolina, a PhD degree from Emory University with a specialized study focus in the New Testament. He has been a professor at several institutions over his 18-year career with a teaching focus on biblical studies, church history, and educational administration. He, ser he currently serves as a gospel preacher here in the area and has served as a deacon in various congregations. He and his family have always been involved actively in the Lord's work wherever they have lived. He has a rich heritage at Florida College. John attended Florida College in the mid-90s. Both of his parents and grandparents alumni of Florida College. And John is the grandson of James R. Cope, the second president of Florida College. And he is the son of John and Kathy Weaver. John and Vivi have five children. Josephine, Adela, Thessaly, Eben, and Viona. And they reside, as I said, here in Temple Terrace. Josephine is a student at FC, and three other children are currently students at the Florida College Academy. Vivi homeschools one of the children. I can tell that you are excited, as I am, about this significant appointment. It's the beginning of a new frontier at Florida College, and that you, me, all of us, everybody online, our entire community, we're counting on you to give your full support to Dr. Weaver. Let's join together in that work to ensure Florida College continues to be a true friend to youth and continues to graduate students that will enlighten the world while at the same time maintaining the strong biblical focus of this fine institution. I now present to you Dr. John Weaver.
Thank you, Mr. Hodges. Thank you for all of your encouragement and your support for Buddy and for me. Buddy, I'm going to tell you, I am not normally a crier, but this moment is going to test my mettle. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm thankful to God for this opportunity, and I'm thankful to the board of directors for their support. I'm thankful for their confidence, to the faculty and staff for their support. I'm so thankful, and to all of you for your prayers. I'm very aware that this moment, its great significance, the great significance of this position is not about me. It's about the strength of the Florida College family. It's about us, our fellowship, our discipleship in Christ, our sojourning as the people of God. This moment is about the youth in this auditorium, here tonight and across this country. This moment is about parents and grandparents who are here in this auditorium and around the country. And they may be watching and, and asking, what will the college become now? Should I send my children there? Should I support Florida College? These are momentous questions. These are questions of this moment. I want to assure you. I want you to have, be confident that my wife, Vivi, and I will fulfill Florida College's mission, that we'll teach biblically and we'll support faithful service. Now, of course, she and I are only a very small part of this community of mission. We'll serve the mission of the school alongside the board of directors and in solidarity with President Payne and Mrs. Payne and with the faculty and staff and in partnership with friends here tonight and around the world, from alumni and camp directors to partners and donors and other friends around the world. I look forward to being able to meet with you all, some of you for the first time in months to come, hearing your voices, listening about your families, asking you what you want and what you need from Florida College. We're a big FC family, and I trust tonight that you understand why I'm especially mindful of my wife and my children. They've been so supportive of this decision and of this step. You know what? They even voted on it. They really did, and it was unanimous. <laughs> yeah, I'm pleased to report it was a yes. It was. I know you'll pray for them and that you'll support them with Christian love. And by God's grace, Vivi and I will be what we've always tried to be. And as I look around, I can't look much or I'll cry. It's what we have seen in so many in this room and many who are watching this evening across the waves. We've seen it in you and we continue to learn from you and from the master teacher. And what we have learned will seek to be, and that is to be a servant to the servants of God. To God be the glory in all of this. What I want you to know is that the college will remain true to its foundation. It's, it's always been that way since the days of my grandfather when he was president. We will be allegiant to Jesus Christ, submissive to the pattern of sound words in the Holy Scriptures, maintaining daily Bible and, and daily chapel, committed to educating youth for service to God and to neighbor. In addition to that, I'm committed to maintaining and strengthening what we call the FC experience, whereby young Christians from around the world gather in a community of scholars to grow faith and to, to be able to grow in Christ-like character and to enjoy each, each other's company for, for, well, four years. And then as a li alumni for a lifetime until we go to heaven by God's good mercy. Before I conclude th this evening, I want to share a brief story with you. I'm thinking tonight of a middle-aged father in Arkansas whom I know of and who I know this spring is deciding whether or not he'll support his daughter in coming to FC. Like my father, in Arkansas 30 years ago when I was 18 year old, 
He wants his child to remain close to home and to go to a local state school where there's a faithful church and where the financial costs seem more affordable. Now, in part because of this influence, I stayed at that local college, and I did very well academically. And some Christians, thankfully, are able to have a similar experience at a state university or at a community college and be faithful to God all of their lives. But as for me, after I graduated there, I was as successful as a 22-year-old could be in the world's eyes. But I was drifting. I was drifting from my Christian focus. I had few Christian friends and a faith that wasn't really concerned and wasn't really connecting my faith to all that I had learned over those past four years. And so I packed my bags. Really, it was just one bag and a truckload full of books. And I came down to Florida College to continue my studies and to affect my faith. I came to reconnect to the faith of my fathers, a faith that was once for all delivered but was embodied in the Bible classes of Melvin Curry and in the communication class of D. Bowman and in the church history class of Colley Caldwell and Ed Harrell. And they created in me a life of Christian scholarship that exists here in these students up here, whether they're in Bible or music or kinesiology. It's an integration, you see. It's an integration of, of spirit and of body and of relationship and mind that should produce integrity in life and work. And it changed me. And I came to FC to connect with Christian mentors and friends, of friends of youth here like Donald McClendon. Wasn't that an amazing ceremony last night? That's right. And dorm parents like Hurl and Ginny Calvert. Yeah. They, they introduced me to Vivi. And they showed me how to be a husband. And they showed me how to be a better son to my parents and a better brother to my sisters. They showed me how to grow in Christian family. And it changed me. I connected to evangelistic classmates and to a local church here which embodied and lived out the Great Commission. And I became committed to bringing others to Jesus Christ, first halfway around the world in Russia and then in the halls and the classrooms of colleges and universities in the U.S. Others were transformed by God's grace because of what I experienced here at FC. And so what I want to share with that father in Arkansas tonight is that FC is about an excellent four-year experience, but it's more than that. It's about an effect that changes us to be more like Jesus Christ if we give ourselves to it and to him. The fellow students matter a whole lot, but I would tell him it's the spiritual and intellectual force of the classroom and chapel that will prepare his daughter to be a servant to God in family and in other jobs. It's the effect of mentors on campus and in the community that will affect his daughter and that will, that will draw them closer to him and his family in heart all the days of their life, even though they may be separated for a little bit more time in body. As president, I will be committed to this FC experience and to this FC effect so that FC will be the first choice of New Testament Christian families, both because of the excellent academic quality and because it continues to strengthen and serve our families, both in the near term and in ways that it will take generations, even an eternity in heaven, to fully appreciate. May God bless you all. May God bless Florida College. Thank you so much.
two of three. We have one more to go. Thank you, John, and we look forward to your leadership as the sixth president of Florida College. Also, in our board meeting this past Monday, the board unanimously elected Dr. Buddy Payne to the role of chancellor, effective June 1, 2022. And he has accepted this new role, so his retirement was very short. At the very beginning, I said he re he's going to retire from his role as president. I didn't say he was going to retire from Florida College. <laughs> Buddy will be assisting the college in raising funds for our endowment and our capital needs. But maybe more importantly, to echo Dr. Weaver's comments, he will serve as an ambassador for this college by encouraging students to attend and maybe more importantly, talking with parents about the value of sending their children to FC for a Bible-based educational experience that will not only make them better kingdom citizens, but also highly employable. Please join me in congratulating Buddy on this new role effective at the end of the academic year. Well, you just can't get rid of me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am honored that the board has asked me to serve the role of chancellor. One of the reasons is you can define that role about any way you want. <laughs> now they have defined it somewhat in the contract. I intend to work hand in hand with our new president. While the board of directors, please listen to this piece closely. The board of directors has many responsibilities. They are the overseers of Florida College. They are the ultimate owners of Florida College. And every one of them are volunteers. They get paid nothing for what they do. In fact, they give us a lot of money besides volunteering their time. And I can't tell you what a blessing it has been to me. And John, you can hardly wait for this piece. We have a phenomenal board of directors who are so committed to the cause of Christ and to the cause of Florida College. So I want you to help me thank these folks. They are amazing, and you wouldn't know that as well till you sat in this seat. And John's going to learn it better than he ever dreamed. But they are a wonderful group of people. So I want the board of directors who are currently serving and the past board of directors to stand up. And John, that includes you. All the board members, please stand up and let, please help me thank them. God bless you. <laughs> That's good. Get your exercise. <laughs> Okay. Now I want to finish what I wanted to say about that specifically. The Presidential Search Committee, of whom Craig Hodges was the chair, and all of the board members would tell you that they have no greater responsibility than the selection of the president. While I have no role as president in that selection process, other than to answer questions they ask you, just like everybody else they brought before them, I can assure you that this board, under the leadership of the search committee, has left no stone unturned in their thoughtful and prayerful deliberations. Their unanimous support of Dr. John Weaver as our new president is grounded firmly on solid research, 
careful listening, and prayerful consideration. You can be absolutely certain of that. Having worked closely with John Weaver myself over the last two and a half years, and having looked carefully into his past experiences and work in the kingdom of God prior to hiring him as our academic dean almost three years ago, I have no doubt, ladies and gentlemen and brothers and sisters, that he is completely committed to the mission and purposes of this institution that his leadership of the college will be firmly grounded on those principles, and that his heartfelt desire is for Florida College to be forward-thinking, changing in the ways that make her best so she can serve her students better, while never changing the principles on which it has been built that are founded upon the rock of the Word of God. I'm excited to work closely with him over the next four months in our transition time and to serve under his leadership starting June 1, 2022. We covet your continued support, your thoughts and ideas, your constructive criticisms, and your fervent prayers as we give our best to make our dear FC the best she can be while we honor the God of the heavens in our business. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say a few more thank yous. So you're going to have to bear with me. First, I look out over this audience and I think back on my first year as president when I traveled all over this country and visited 20 out of 22 summer camps. Some of you remember that. And I'm looking at all this audience and I think of people who took me into their homes and fed me and treated me like royalty and all the camps that made a great deal out of having a president come. And that was just the beginning. Because what it did was it opened doors all over this country to go see people, to connect with people, and to become part of people. And I want to tell you a big thank you to everybody of our supporters all over this country. One of the greatest blessings, John, you're going to have is the privilege of getting to know all these people all over this country who care so much about what's going on here. So I'm thanking you for me and for my Marilyn who loaned me to you, see, all those times. And I already mentioned the Board of Directors, so I'll not say that again, but these are quality folks. I do want to tell you, though, that first summer when we toured the camps, one of my goals was to take a Board of Director with me to every camp. Some of the Board of Directors had never been to a camp. Most of them had, but some of them hadn't, and I made them go with me. Well, I didn't make them. I asked them, and they agreed. <laughs> and we had a Board of Directors member at every camp, and we were able to thank them. We also had a large donor go with us, and so the kids could thank the donor. It was a good beginning. A special thank you to the faculty and staff of our school through these last 13 years. Yeah, that's so good. Thank you. Mm. I think Craig Hodges said it well. Y'all have learned what I knew a lot, too, how dedicated these people are. I mean, they love this place. When you talk to other business people, you know, folks have loyalty to their business. But there's nothing like what we've got here, folks. You are aware, right, that every employee that comes to work here does so because they choose to come here and sacrifice to serve. That's where they come. And many of them take a significant cut in salary just so they can be here. It's incredible, and the dedication and sacrifice is beyond what I can describe. And then you have to let me take just a minute to talk about my Marilyn. The president's wife has to sponsor a lot of events. And any lady that sponsored an event knows how meticulous they are about those things. I'm not that meticulous. I could care less what the centerpiece looks like. 
but my Marilyn will spend 10 hours on one centerpiece. And you got to make 20 of them. And how many times does that happen in 13 years? I lost count. You have to plan the menu when you invite people to your house, right? I mean, we, we've entertained employees and alums and others in our home through the years. But good mamas and cooks and wives don't just plan menus. They plan experiences, right? So people will be comforted and comfortable and everything looks good. I mean, you don't bring folks in without cleaning everything up, right? So numerous preparations of all kinds of things, comfort for all, preparations after preparations. And then share everything that the president brings home. I'm just going to tell you one thing, folks. I know I'm not alone when I say that presidents reach low points. And my Maryland saved me from low points. If it weren't for her, I don't know how I would have handled the lowest of the low. Because we share everything. And I get all the glory. And that's just the way it is. So I'm telling you, that's where the glory belongs. Period. Amen. And all of you know very well, because you tried your best in your house to have a home that's in the image of Christ, the heart is in mama and the wife, isn't it? That's where the heart is. And I'm blessed that God has given me a wife, whom, by the way, I met right here. <laughs> Don't you kids miss the opportunities. <laughs> that's not why you're here. But it sure is a nice benefit. <laughs> I hear amens? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but my sweetheart not only has the heart of the home, but she loves God with all her heart. And I'm telling you, when our kids were growing up, and we had three in two years, that's terrible planning. There wasn't a night that my Marilyn would let them go to bed without having something in their precious minds from God's word, period. That was like a devotion. And so the result of all of that is we've watched our children serve us. And I can tell you, I can't leave this podium without saying to you, our children have helped this presidency and his wife. I can't tell you how many times they've swooped in <laughs> when we needed help. That's a good expression. Don't you think? You say, we don't know they're coming, but they're coming. And they're coming because we need help. And it was never more beautiful than when last April we both got COVID and were so sick we could hardly handle ourselves. And our kids swooped in, they moved into our house left their own house and moved into our house and took care of us. It was incredible. But it's but one illustration through all these years. So kids, we can't tell you how much we love you. Yeah, there are four of them. She wants to be sure I say four. Three daughters and a son and every one of them 
has been such a blessing to us. So, yeah, that's good. Thank you. And by the way, kids, I don't want the swooping to stop just because I'm not president anymore. <laughs> All right, now some thank yous for people who've been doing us so much good for this event. Sierra Schmidt, have you seen her everywhere? <laughs> Sierra Schmidt works in the advancement office as our event coordinator. I would call her the event everything. The first night we came in, she was parking the cars, too. So she's a working manager, that's for sure. And what a delightful spirit that she has about her. And the whole advancement team and the marketing team, I'm not going to go down the road and name everybody, folks, but it's, they've all put a lot of work into this, and we appreciate them. Tom Garland and his whole maintenance staff, you probably never heard of him. Maybe you have. The kids have. And look, can you feel the air blowing? This air conditioning has not stopped the whole week. Praise the Lord. And there's a whole lot of other stuff went on behind the scenes you don't know anything about because stuff broke and they fixed it and you didn't even know it. Alpha Club and the student volunteers helping us around here. God bless you. <clears throat> you see all these people back here? The audio video crew? They're all over the place. That's going on all over the campus. It's continual. What is it, Stephen, 20 hours a day? Close to it. And so they deserve your special congratulations. God bless you. And? Our students give up their parking spaces and the seats down here to sit up there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, AV guys, we're about ready for the song. You got it ready? Okay. Yeah. All right, we have a tradition that we close the last night of lectures with one verse of this wonderful song. And I can tell you as far as I'm aware, and Kali, you might correct me, didn't Brother Cope start this? Brother Cope was 33 years our president, granddaddy of our new president. Don't you love that? Tradition. And he loved this song. And I do too. So I have tried to pick that tradition up again and use it. And this is what we wish for you, that God will take care of you. And he will. You know that. His providential care is beyond belief. And the first lesson of this series was God's covenant promises. He keeps his promises. So let's leave with those beautiful thoughts on our minds. And at the end of that one song, one verse of that song, our board member Wally Hayes, the longest tenured board member, he's, on the, he's been on the board since 1998. And he's an elder in the local church here at Temple Terrace. He's going to lead us in our closing prayer, and we will be dismissed after that. Before that, Sierra, have I forgotten something? Okay. That's pretty good for an old guy. 
All right, let's stand up and sing one verse of God Will Take Care of You. Be not dismayed. Would you bow and pray with me? Almighty God, you are the author of our life. We're in all of your creation. You are the savior of the world. We are so amazed at your love and grace. Our suffering finds hope in your healing hands. The burden rests in your promise. The oppressed are unchained by your freedom. You are conditional love. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful and amazing blessing of today, for your word of hope, which gives us strength, for your love that makes our life meaningful, for your peace that gives us comfort, for your grace that renews and stores, restores our life. Father, especially now, we ask your riches and bountiful blessings and guidance upon this college, her students, her faculty, and her staff, and the board of directors, as we work together to ensure that this school remains true to the mission of integrating the lives of our students into the revealed will of God, preparing them for lives of service to you, our creator, and to humanity. May we truly be a friend to our youth. We thank you, Father, now especially for our brother and sister, Buddy and Marilyn Payne, for their long years of uncompromising service to this institution and may they long continue to serve you and this college. Father, we pray that you will be in the hearts of John and Vivia Weaver as John moves into his new role as president of Florida College, reminding him always to be a humble leader. May John be filled with understanding and wisdom that comes only from you as he helps fill our students with your vision for all, a home in eternity with you. May John and the faculty and staff strive together to move our core principles as together they move Florida College on the path into the future without compromising our mission. Father, we're so appreciative of your grace and love in sending your son to die in our place even before we acknowledge you as God and for accepting us into your family through the blood of your son, Jesus. We know, Father, we will receive your promise because you are the promise giver. Help us to use those gifts that you have given us to bring honor and glory to your name. It's in your son's name that we petition you. In his name we pray, amen.